Fire, Flesh, and Faith, How Cooking Created the Human Spirit. Published by Seth Chagy. Picture a small group gathered at twilight. Sparks rise, meat crackles, tubers sweeten. Voices soften as the night pulls tight around a glow that feeds bodies and quiets fear. If there is a single scene where biology, culture, and meaning braided together into something recognizably human, it is the hearth. This is a story of energy and enzymes, of smoke and ash, of kin and strangers who learn to sit close without claws. It is also a story of wonder. The question is simple and audacious. Did the hearth become the first altar? I think the answer is yes in spirit and maybe in fact. Here is why. Fire changed our bodies. Cooking does not only make food tasty, it changes the math of life. Thermal processing breaks cell walls, denatures proteins, gelatinizes starch, and kills pathogens. That means more calories are available with less work by the gut. Experiments that measured energy gain directly show what many of us have felt since childhood when we discovered roasted marshmallows are suspiciously satisfying. In controlled studies, mammals fed cooked meat or cooked starchy plants get more usable energy and gain more mass than those fed the same foods raw, even when activity and intake are held constant. The energetic edge of cooking is large enough to matter in evolution. This energy story links to a second line of evidence about brains, bodies, and time. Human brains are expensive organs. They burn an outrageous share of our resting metabolism. Analyses of neuronal counts and feeding time argue that a raw diet places a ceiling on brain size because there are not enough daylight hours to chew and digest what a large brain would cost. The path out of that bottleneck is higher energy yield per bite. Cooking is the obvious route. Put these findings together and you have a clean argument. Cooking raises net energy yield from key foods. Once control of fire becomes routine, hominins can afford smaller guts and larger brains while spending fewer hours feeding. That is an evolutionary bargain with downstream effects on everything from dental anatomy to daily schedules. The claim is not dogma. It is a working model with experimental support and a plausible ecological pathway. Fire entered the archeological record, then took over. How early did our ancestors use fire inside spaces they lived in rather than dodge wildfires and carry embers? Secure evidence now reaches back roughly 1 million years. Microstratigraphic work at Wonderwork Cave in South Africa shows ash and burned bone in place far inside the cave. These are not traces blown in by wind or washed by water. They are residues of combustion where people lived. This is the earliest widely accepted in situ fire in an archeological context. By around 780,000 years ago in the Levant, the pattern becomes richer. At Gesher Benoya Akhov, the distribution of burned flint, seeds, and wood fragments is localized rather than random. The spatial pattern suggests repeated burning at specific spots, very likely hearths, and therefore control rather than mere encounter. Later work even used thermoluminescence and spatial modeling to evaluate fire intensity across activity areas. The signal is behavioral, not accidental. By 300 to 400,000 years ago, in several regions, fire use becomes habitual rather than sporadic. In Europe, a broad review concluded that routine, Repeated fire appears surprisingly late and becomes common only after roughly 400 to 300,000 years. That late takeoff matters because once fire is dependable, it can structure how people butcher, cook, and share, not just how they warm their hands. Kesem Cave in Israel shows what habitual fire looks like on the ground. There, researchers documented repeated use of a central hearth over many occupation episodes with associated cut marks, bone breakage for marrow extraction, and blade production nearby. The hearth sat in the middle like a social machine, and activities radiated from it in a way that feels familiar to anyone who has stood in a busy kitchen while everything important happens around the stove. Fire reshaped daily life and social structure. Energy freed time, light extended day. Warmth pulled people into closer proximity. Those ecological changes created social opportunities. A central hearth encourages central place foraging and delays consumption. Meat need not be devoured on the spot with blood still warm. It can be brought home, roasted, and shared. Archaeofaunal evidence at Kesem Cave shows exactly that picture. Carcass transport was selective, processing was organized near the fire, and meat sharing is the best explanation for the pattern of broken bones and cut marks. Sharing is not a moral lesson here. It is a logistical solution that turns dangerous hunts into reliable meals and reputations. 
We can also watch what people do with the night once they have a pool of light. Ethnographic studies of foragers in the Kalahari compared conversations by day and by firelight. Day talk leans toward work and social friction. Night talk tilts to stories, music, and ritual. Firelight changes the subject and over time, culture itself. Narratives travel further than meat and last longer than embers. The result is a quiet revolution. Fire stabilizes calories and it also stabilizes meaning. There is even evidence that watching fire can lower blood pressure, especially when sound is present. That is one small physiological clue to what our ancestors might have felt as the flames settled into a rhythm and voices slowed. Calm is not a trivial byproduct. A calmer group can sit longer, listen harder, and agree on things that matter. What cooking did to the senses. A cooked meal is a symphony of chemistry. Starch molecules swell and uncoil. Proteins denature and form new bonds. Fats render and carry volatile compounds up into the nose before a bite is taken. The Maillard reaction paints a signal of readiness on meat and tubers alike. These changes do not only entice, they shortcut digestion. Mice do not need to know molecular biology to show weight gain differences when given cooked versus raw diets under controlled conditions. They just do. Humans with larger brains and bodies that evolved under selection for higher energy throughput would have felt the edge even more. Add light and sound, and you get a full sensory ecology. Firelight is warm and flickering. It reduces blue wavelengths that keep us hyper alert and replaces them with long wavelengths that flatter skin and wood. Crackle adds an auditory metronome that masks small noises in the dark and draws a crowd to one focal point. The combined audiovisual stimulus relaxes people measurably in experiments. That is not mystical. It is nervous system math. And it is one reason storytelling thrives at night by the flames. The hearth made space sacred. If we take animism seriously, the hearth is not only a tool, it is a presence. It devours and gives. It demands attention and rewards devotion. Archaeology cannot read prayers. It can map ash and analyze bone fat. Even so, there are moments when the pattern looks like ceremony. Start with the simplest case. A central hearth used again and again in the same place over centuries signals more than convenience. It speaks to a mental map of home that anchors bodies and remembers events. Kesem Cave offers that exact signature. Micromorphology shows superimposed ash lenses and heat-altered sediments stacked like rings of a tree. People return to one living flame that marked the center of their social world. That is the structure of a shrine, whether or not anyone would have used that word. Move forward in deep history, and the relationship between fire and symbol grows overt. In Central Europe during the Gravedian, people fired small clay figures in simple kilns at sites like Dolni Vestonice. These are some of the earliest ceramics on Earth, and they are art, not pots. They required careful control of temperature and atmosphere, which means planning, skill, and shared knowledge around fire. We can argue about what the figures meant. We cannot argue that fire became a partner in deliberate acts of making that blur utility and ritual. Now widen the lens beyond prehistory. Across many later traditions, the hearth is a formal sacred focus, from Hestia in Greek religion to Vesta in Roman public life. This is not a proof that early hearths were altars. It does show a durable human habit of treating domestic fire as a bearer of order, purity, and continuity between household and cosmos. When a pattern endures across time and culture, it is at least reasonable to look for its roots in older behavior, costs, and complications. Fire is not a free lunch. Smoke damages lungs, eyes, and hearts. Sparks burn children and old kin. Sparks also burn landscapes when wind rises. Archaeologists debate whether the earliest fire signals reflect regular control or opportunistic use. In Europe, there is a long stretch where occupation spreads into cold latitudes without strong evidence for routine fire indoors. That caution matters. The simplest picture is not always the true one. Still, by 300 to 400,000 years ago, the material record in multiple regions shows fire integrated into daily life and food processing, and after that the social and sensory consequences would have been hard to reverse. There is also the honest point that brain size trends and fire control timelines do not line up perfectly. Some researchers argue that significant encephalization predates routine cooking. That is a real challenge and a good reminder that evolution is a braid of causes, not a straight pipeline. Even so, when you look at energy budgets, digestive anatomy, and the clear performance edge of cooked foods, cooking still reads as a major amplifier of the human niche rather than a minor garnish. 
So did the hearth become the first altar? Altar is a heavy word. It implies offering and presence and a shared grammar of reverence. In that strict sense, formal altars come later with architecture and priests. But if we loosen the term to mean a place where matter and meaning meet under a rule of attention, then yes, the hearth is our proto-altar. It is where we first learn to trade the chaos of the night for a circle of light, to slow down enough to tell stories and remember them, to transform the raw into the good through a repeated act that felt both practical and profound. It is where we learn that devotion has a form. Feed the fire, watch it, share what it makes possible. Do not look away when it needs care. That is ritual in every sense that matters, and it changes the people who practice it. As a Stoic would note, fire teaches discipline and acceptance. You do not control the flame fully. You work with it, you prepare, you attend, you respond. As a Nordic animist might say, fire has a spirit. It is alive enough to negotiate with, worthy of respect and dangerous without it. As a Zen practitioner would add, fire is the breath made visible, a present moment that radiates and fades. Taoists would smile and call it one more way the 10,000 things move in balance. No doctrine necessary. Sit quietly and watch the coals. You will feel what our ancestors felt. A last image. Imagine a child at the edge of a Paleolithic hearth. The child is drowsy and full. On a flat stone, a parent sets roasted marrow bones. On another, a tuber splits and steams. Voices braid a story of a hunt and a flood and an ancestor who became a star. Sparks climb. The child stares into the red and sees patterns. The first altars did not need temples. They needed only fire, food, and faces close enough to care. That is how cooking created the human spirit, not by magic, but by energy and attention, by making a place where we could be fully animal and more than animal at once. The hearth did not just feed us, it formed us. Ah, work cited, Alperson Afil, N 2008. Continual fire making by hominins at Gesher Benoya Achov, Israel. Quaternary Science Reviews 27. Alperson Afil, N Nanin, and N Gorin Inbar. 2004, Evidence of Hominin Control of Fire at Gesher Benot Yaakov, Israel. Science 304, Barkai, R, A. Gopher and colleagues. 2014, Evidence for the Repeated Use of a Central Hearth at Middle Pleistocene Kasem Cave, Israel. Journal of Archaeological Science 44, Berna, F, P, Goldberg, L. K. Horwitz, J. Brink, S. Holt, M. Bamford, and M. Chazan. 2012. Microstratigraphic evidence of in situ fire in the Aculean strata of Wonderwork Cave, South Africa. Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. Carmody, R.N. and R.W. Rangham. 2009. The Energetic Significance of Cooking. Journal of Human Evolution 57. Carmody, R.N., Z. Weintraub and R.W. Rangham. 2011. Energetic Consequences of Thermal and Non-Thermal Food Processing. Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, Gopher A. R. Barkai, M. C. Steiner, and colleagues. 2011. Hearthside Socioeconomics, Hunting, and Paleoecology During the Late Lower Paleolithic at Kesem Cave, Israel. Journal of Human Evolution 60. Herculano Housel, S. Dot, and K. Fonseca Azevedo. 2012. Metabolic constraint imposes a trade-off between body size and number of brain neurons in human evolution. Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, 109. Henry, A.G., A.S. Brooks, and D.R. Piperno. 2011. Microfossils in calculus demonstrate consumption of plants and cooked foods in Neanderthal diets. Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, 108. Carcanus, P. R. Shahak Gross, F. Berna, C. Lemarini, A. Gopher, and R. Barkai. 2014. Evidence for the repeated use of a central hearth at Middle Pleistocene Kasem Cave, Israel. Journal of Archaeological Science 44. Carcanus, P. and S. Weiner. 2011. Microarchaeological approaches to the identification and interpretation of combustion features in prehistoric sites. Journal of Archaeological Method and Theory, 18. Lynn, C.D. 2014. Hearth and Campfire Influences on Arterial Blood Pressure. Evolutionary Psychology 12. Robrooks, W., and P. Villa, 2011. On the Earliest Evidence for Habitual Use of Fire in Europe. 
Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, 108. Shahat Gross, R. F. Berna, P. Carcanas, C. Lemarini, A. Gopher, and R. Barkai, 2014. Evidence for the repeated use of a central hearth at Middle Pleistocene Kasem Cave, Israel. Journal of Archaeological Science, 44. Shimelmitz, R. A. Gopher, R. Barkai, and colleagues. 2014. Fire at Will. The emergence of habitual fire used 350,000 years ago. Journal of Human Evolution 77. Steiner, M. C. R. Barkai, and a Gopher. 2011. Hearthside Socioeconomics at Kesem Cave, Israel. Journal of Human Evolution 60. Wiesner, P. 2014. I am Embers of Society. Firelight Talk Among the Jew Huansi. Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, 111. Rangham, R.W., 2009. Catching Fire, How Cooking Made Us Human. Book widely cited in the literature on the cooking hypothesis. For experimental and review work linked to the hypothesis, see Carmody and colleagues above. Further references on fire, ritual, and symbol. Burkert, W., 1985. Greek Religion, Archaic and Classical. Harvard University Press. On Hestia and the Sacral Role of the Civic Hearth. Gordon. R. 2016. Vesta, Vestals, Oxford Classical Dictionary, a reliable summary of the Roman hearth cult as public religion. Vandiver, P.B. 1987, and later work cited in The Origins of Ceramic Technology at Dolny Vestonitz. American Anthropologist, 89, for an early synthesis on fired clay figurines as a fire using technology connected to symbolic action. Recent imaging studies on the Dolny Vestonese figurines. See Microcomputed Tomography Investigation of the Fired Clay Venus and Background on Pavlovian Ceramics, Journal of Archaeological Science, Reports 2024. Author's note, the citations above anchor the main claims. Debates continue about timing and causation. That is the work. But the outline is strong. Fire increased net energy, reconfigured time and space, and pulled people into a circle where food and story could be shared. That circle looks a lot like the first altar.